All right. Great to see everyone. Welcome. Uh, good evening and welcome to the Democracy in America series at the virtual NHFPL. My name is Luis Chavez Bramel and I'm the Wilson Library Branch Manager. Thanks for attending tonight's program. I'm excited to announce, uh, to welcome you all to the first Democracy in America for 2020-2021, the partnership between the Haven Free Public Library and Public Humanities at Yale. It continues tonight with a great conversation with Professors Matthew Fry Jacobson and Andy Horowitz. Tonight's topic is Professor Horowitz's book, Katrina, A History, 1915 to 2015, which is now, like I'm happy to say, available for curbside pickup at the NHFPL Find Free. So I now turn it over to Professor Jacobson. Thank you, Luis. Uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, I just want to say a couple of words uh, at the outset, of words of thanks. Thanks to Luis and also our other uh, partners at the New Haven Free Public Library, uh, in particular, Marion Huggins and Seth Godfrey. This has been a really important uh, partnership for us in the public humanities, and we um, eagerly await the day we can all be in the same room together once again. Um, in the meantime, we do what we can. I also want to say thanks to my colleague in public humanities, Karen Rothman, and uh, our administrator, Amy Depoy, uh, both of whom have done enormous amounts of work, uh, and in fact are working right now behind the scenes to make this event possible. So thank you so much. And one quick announcement, our next, uh, our next library talk will be Tuesday, October 27. We will hear from Phil Rubio on uh, the topic of the Postal Service as a democratic institution. Phil Rubio is the author of Undelivered from the Great Postal Strike of 1970 to the Manufactured Crisis of the US Postal Service. And that book is just out in 2020. Um, that will be one week out from the election, so everyone will be appropriately anxiety-ridden and praying for the Postal Service, but it will be a timely discussion of that particular institution. Um, so welcome, and welcome especially to our guest, Andy Horowitz. Uh, in a weird way, this is welcome back. Uh, Andy is a native of New Haven and uh, a graduate of, of Yale University. His PhD is in history from Yale. Um, although in this cyber world, there's no such thing as back exactly, but welcome Andy and, and congratulations on the book. Well, thank you. So as a start, um, you know, you could give a million people a shot at this and most of them would not begin a history of the catastrophe called Katrina uh, by starting in the year 1915. Um, so can you talk a little bit about why for you the story starts a century ago um, and, and what we get in our, uh, our kind of conceptualization of that catastrophe by going back that far and kind of thinking so deeply historically? Uh, I can, but you know, for, first I should of course also say thank you to you and to everyone who put this together and it's good to be at least virtually home. Um, I was realizing just during the introduction, I'm certain that the, well, first of all, the, the public, the New Haven Public Library was surely the first club I was ever a member of and my, the first, um, the first archive I was ever in as a historian was the local history room of the public library when I wrote my high school term paper on the carriage industry in New Haven. So I'm, I'm home in all kinds of ways and, and really grateful for it and grateful to get to do it with you, Matt, one of my important teachers and treasured friends. So, right, Katrina, um, when most people hear that, you know, just hear about Hurricane Katrina, have someone say that phrase, of course, they think about, I'm certain that terrible day, on August 29th, 2005, when the hurricane uh, made landfall outside of New Orleans and pushed a storm surge up against the levees, which collapsed and flooded 80% of the city and all of the St. Bernard Parish, the county just to the east of New Orleans, and hundreds of people drowned, thousands more rendered homeless. Um, but that's about, I think, all the picture often brings to mind. And that is consistent, I think, with how we often imagine disasters in general. We think of them as as short, as sort of acute emergencies that we always call them unprecedented, which means that they're events without histories. And I was out to pursue a different idea. I wanted to um, pursue the idea that disasters have histories and that their causes and consequences stretch across uh, long periods of time and space. And so 1915 in particular, 
I start there with an account of a different hurricane. In late September 1915, there was um, probably the largest storm to make landfall in Louisiana in the 20th century, uh, arrived in New Orleans, and it came at a time when the city had just finished building what was then a state-of-the-art pump system, a, a drainage system. And, and um, well, you have to understand that since the New Orleans had its colonial founding in 1718, for 200 years after that, the city was largely constrained to the natural high ground near the Mississippi River, um, which was tightly populated just there. The rest of the city was basically a swamp for the rest of the area. And this drainage system, which they'd started, the city had started in the 1890s, was meant to drain those swamps and enable the city to grow and develop in these, in these wetlands. Um, and what happened after the, this 1915 hurricane, which though, though it caused a fair amount of damage, that the city saw it as a test of its new pump system and believed that they had passed. Um, a couple days after the hurricane, the newspaper in New Orleans ran a headline that says, the record shows New Orleans is stormproof. And after that, uh, the city began to expand. This confirmed a consensus that had been pretty widely held, not just among engineers and city planners, but just New Orleanians in general, that the city should and, and could grow uh, off the river. And the city, the, the neighborhoods that were built after 1915 were often among the most desirable neighborhoods in the city. These are single family homes with nice yards. You know, in New Haven, we could think about Hamden. You know, this is what much, much of the city looked like and built with many of the same federal policies that, that built Hamden. The GI Bill, for example, is very important in allowing the city to grow. Well, if you, if you then fast forward to 2005 when the levees broke, um, if you were to trace the flood line of the Katrina flood, you basically would be outlining the city as it stood nine decades earlier, right around the time of that 1915 hurricane. Most of the buildings that were built before 1915 did not flood. Nearly all of the buildings that were built after 1915 did. And this, I think, unsettles the way a lot of us thought about Katrina and still think about Katrina, because it wasn't um, exclusively black New Orleans rather than white New Orleans that flooded. It wasn't wealthy, I mean, poor New Orleans rather than wealthy New Orleans that flooded. It was 20th century New Orleans. And so as I set out to answer what to me were just kind of some fundamental questions about the disaster, you know, who lit, which neighborhoods flooded, who lived there, why did they live there? This taught me that uh, the, the 20th century history of the city of New Orleans, which is the 20th century history of the United States, uh, was gonna have to be part of the answer. So can you say more about um, how race figures in the story as you tell it? Because it's really, I mean, everyone who remembers those images from, you know, those, you know, that week, um, between, between the 29th of August and around the 6th or 7th or 10th of September, just it emblazoned in the national consciousness this sense of racial inequity. Um, but that's, well, as you're saying, it's kind of a misperception or it's an oversimplification of what was actually happening. But what you find in your 20th century story is, is that race is all over it. I mean, there's no way to tell this story without race. Um, the Dixiecrats are important to the story you tell. White supremacism and segregationism are, are important to the story you tell. So can you flesh that out a little bit for us? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, race and racism structure American inequality. It touches everything. Um, in, the, in the specific case of flood vulnerability, in New Orleans, it has a really kind of insidious and circuitous root. So in the, over the course of 20th century growth of the city, um, racism functioned to keep black people from moving into those new neighborhoods uh, that, that, were, that were built with the GI Bill, say. Um, and segregationist statutes, Jim Crow statutes, sought to keep black people confined to older parts of the city that were seen as undesirable in every way except they happen to be on higher ground, which helps to explain why when the levees broke, um, black people were not, as, as many sort of observers imagined would be the case, were not disproportionately flooded. Um, the, a person's race was not, not a very strong predictor of whether their house flooded. One way of, um, this is a, a grim statistic, but nonetheless, among people who, who were counted as Katrina deaths, 67% uh, of the people who died in New Orleans were black, 
67% of New Orleanians were black at the time of the flood. And if you look in St. Bernard Parish, I say parish counties are called parishes uh, in Louisiana. St. Bernard Parish, which was more than, uh, let's call it 90% white in 2005, 10% uh, black, the flood victims there were 10% black and 90% white. So there was a kind of uh, you know, grim proportionality to that. However, and, and this, is, this is where it's important, the, the book has two parts. Now here's part two of the book. Um, if you look at New Orleans from the perspective of 10 years after the flood, um, the population was down around 90,000 or so. And it was 8,000 white people fewer than had been in New Orleans in 2005, but 92,000 fewer black people than had been in the city in 2005. So that vast disparity there is not explainable by the flood. In the book, I give an account of two neighborhoods, which I could talk about quickly here, uh, the Lower Ninth Ward and Lakeview. Um, Lakeview is a, a neighborhood of upper middle class and wealthy white people on the Western side of the city, 20,000 people. Um, Lower Ninth Ward was almost exactly the same size, right around 20,000 people, um, around 95% black population in that neighborhood. And if you were, you know, when looking at those pictures in early September, 2005, the aerial shots from helicopters, you couldn't tell which neighborhood was which because they both were under 10 feet of water. In 2015, look, uh, Lakeview was nine out of 10 people from that neighborhood returned. And in the lower ninth, only three out of 10 people had returned. So that disparity is clear. It's not explainable at all by the water. There's nothing inevitable or natural about it. Uh, it's explainable only by the suite of policies that we came to call the Katrina recovery that reapportioned a challenge that had been broadly shared from, you know, onto the backs of poor people and in particular onto the backs of black people. And so you have to look at those sort of recent policies to understand why black people could not return and white people could. Mm -hmm. To what extent was race a predictor of who was able to evacuate and who was not? It was a pretty strong predictor. Um, so there was this rhetoric around the time, you know, 2005, the Michael Chertoff, um, Michael Brown, these figures from the Bush administration that we tried to consign a little bit to the depths of our memory said things like, you know, people chose not to evacuate. Um, there were around 130,000 people left in New Orleans when the levees broke. That's almost exactly the number of people, New Orleanians who didn't have access to a vehicle. And of those, um, that includes around a third of African-American households in the city did not have access to a vehicle. So we think of that as, you know, it, it, somehow it's easier for us to see that side of the story. We should also mention, of course, that the city and the federal government had spent tens of millions, not hundreds of millions of dollars building a highway system that it, and, and subsidizing oil or subsidizing gasoline for cars and all of that that made evacuation possible and comparatively easy for people who could afford a car. Um, those highways were built down Claiborne Avenue. They, they cleared out the historic black neighborhoods of New Orleans. So again, the sort of ease with which white people thought they could do it on their own was actually a huge federal investment that was made in this case, physically on the backs of black neighborhoods in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. how, much, how much is currently known about the, what you might call the Katrina diaspora, the people who, who left during the catastrophe and never came back? It's a hard question. Um, you know, for I, it's something I really wish I knew more about as a scholar, but it's hard to, to trace people. We know a fair amount about where people went sort of in the first year. Um, mostly people didn't go too far. They were in Baton Rouge and Houston and Atlanta. Um, but over the sort of 10 years that followed, you know, there's that, those are still the biggest cities where people went. But the, the, the truth is these people, um, once they left the city, they sort of fall out of any kind of coherent archive. And and it's hard to know where everybody went. But there, you know, there's a bumper sticker you see sometimes now faded that says, be a New Orleanian wherever you are. That's, a, that's someone who fled. Yeah, I was, you know, I was there in 2010 um, as part of a documentary project and I interviewed this fellow who was, he was rebuilding his house in the Lower Ninth and his, his wife at the time was still in, in what he called Katrina diaspora. She was in Fort Worth and he was still, he was a carpenter by trade, 
um, working by day and uh, every night coming home and trying to rebuild his house. And his, his one kind of granular story just captured so much about um, everything that was perverse about the way the city was rebuilt. Um, so one thing was the fact that it was five years later and his wife was still in diaspora. Another was that um, since his housing was basically substandard before the flood, he was being penalized for trying to rebuild it up to code after the flood. And so the, and can you say a little bit about the, the road home and other, other policies in post-Katrina New Orleans that really structured the ways, I mean, really iced the inequalities as they had existed? Yeah, and, and, and that's, I mean, iced is, is, is a great verb here because um, unlike much of, so most welfare policy, if you imagine most American welfare policy, it's designed to help people out. Take a homeless person and help them go into a house. You know, take a person who's in poverty and bring them up out of poverty. Disaster policy is somewhat unique and uniquely perverse in that it's designed to put people back exactly as they were before. Um, and that comes from this idea that disasters are short exceptions and that the goal is simply to return things to the status quo ante, just put things back, get back to normal as quickly as possible. And so, right, if you were a homeless person and you applied for a disaster relief you know, housing grant, that's seen as illegitimate. You can go to jail for making such an application. It's not designed to house people. It's designed to put no, people, and, and people back and as they people, were. And people have, correct? Yeah, yeah, this is, yes, this is absolutely, you can end up in jail for fraud for making that kind of application. Um, it, what happened, so in particular, you mentioned the road home. The road home was the, um, that's the name of the uh, large housing policy. Congress appropriated, I forget what the final number is, some just shy of $10 billion to, Louisiana to try to get people back in homes. Now, some of the pieces of that policy were pretty obvious how they would play out. For example, there were no um, direct grants for people who rented. They only went, it was only designed to get people who had been homeowners back. But then the way it was designed in these sort of insidious policy choices um, fixed or magnified existing inequality. So the one I'm thinking of right now is that the road home grants were capped at one of two numbers. The maximum grant you could get was either was up to $150,000, that was one cap, but the other was, it was capped at the market value of your house before the flood. So what that means is if your house was worth $200,000, you were eligible for a $150,000 grant. But if it was only worth, according to the market value, $100,000, then you were, that was the maximum grant you were allowed, was $100,000 by relying on market values, which were seen as kind of a neutral way to figure out what, what people should get, and as a way of making sure people didn't come out ahead on these grants was the fear. Um, because of the history of racism in the real estate industry, underdevelopment, redlining, and all of that, homes in white neighborhoods are worth more than homes in black neighborhoods. Um, and effectively, it made white people eligible for larger grants than black people in New Orleans, even for the exactly the same damage. Two homes with precisely the same damage were eligible for different amounts. And the, the disparity, the racial disparity because of that decision in New Orleans was something on the tune of half a billion dollars in aid. So even though it took, I mean, nobody liked the road home because it took years to distribute even a single grant. But even once they finally got their grants, white people simply got more money than black people. And that's one of the important reasons that um, white people were easy, it was easier for them to come home than for black people. And that policy was ultimately found unconstitutional. It violated the Fair Housing Act, but that decision didn't come for six years after the money was already gone and it was too late to make it make a real difference. Right, and you're saying, and that's, that's at the intersection of the way that race structures the real estate market and the way that disaster relief works. We imagine that the market offers some kind of escape from history supposed to be just this rational arbiter that destroys the past. But in fact, it is, so, it is so defined by structural racism in American history that it offers no escape at all. It just reaffirms it. And in this case, magnified it. Yeah. Yeah, I want to get to some of those broader issues. I, I obviously don't want to lose the specificities of New Orleans, um, and we won't. But I do want to zoom out a little bit and talk about some, some broader issues. But but one last really specific New Orleans question. I know that you've become um, kind of famous locally as uh, 
uh, either a, a Cassandra or a naysayer or maybe an Eeyore. I don't know how you want to characterize it, but you're, you're locally famous for not feeling so great about the way the redevelopment has gone. Um, can you give us your assessment of current day New Orleans and, and especially around the questions of the continuing vulnerabilities? Yeah, um, I guess that is my reputation. I was going to argue, but I think that's, I think that's probably fair. Uh, so how is New Orleans today? You know, that, that question is basically impossible to answer because the inequality is so great. Um, that to offer a question on, to offer an answer on the scale of the city is sort of to lie about one group of people or another. Um, there were, there were survey, a, a pretty good survey done in 2015, 10 years after the flood, asking New Orleanians whether they thought the city had gotten better or worse. And most white people said it had gotten better and that recovery policies had aided them. Most black people said the city had gotten worse and recovery policies had not been designed to help them. And I think that was pretty accurate um, for, for a lot of people. That was true to their experience. They had two different experiences of the same place. So how is the city now? It depends how you ask. In terms of its, its flood vulnerability in particular, uh, there's a new levy system, $14 billion levy system. And it is better built than the one that collapsed in 2005, built to a lower standard though. Um, more likely to be overtopped, less likely to collapse. And, and meanwhile, we haven't talked about this, but New, you know, New Orleans is surrounded by wetlands, by marshes that had once been a, a buffer for storm surge, and it protected the city. The city grew much more vulnerable over the course of the 20th century, in large part because oil companies dredged canals through these wetlands that allowed salt water to come, at what well, allowed, first of all, you know, their boats to get out and reach the rigs and pipelines to be laid, but it also allowed salt water to come into the marsh, which killed the grass grass holds the ground together. And that's a big part of the reason why 2000 square miles of Louisiana have disappeared over the course of the 20th century and the state continues to sink. Meanwhile, the oil that is, you know, piped through those collapsing marshes, we still burn it and it causes the seas to rise. Um, relative sea level rise is higher in coastal Louisiana than almost anywhere else in the United States. And it ranks as one of the highest places in the world. So, um, yeah, I don't have, I don't have too much good to say about the long-term sort of environmental, you know, solidity of, of New Orleans. You're saying that the, the erosion of the wetlands isn't simply a matter of land mismanagement, but it's also, or water mismanagement, I suppose, but it's, it's directly tied to the requirements of the oil industry. Yeah, there's, there's two main causes. One is the one I just said, the oil industry dredged these canals, um, and you can, there's, uh, you can imagine given the stakes of this, a pretty big debate over what percentage of the loss is attributable to oil companies. Um, but it is somewhere between 30 and 60%, a big percentage of it. The rest of it is because um, the Army Corps of Engineers has built levees along the Mississippi River, the big muddy, all that mud used to flood every spring. And that is the geological process that built Louisiana. Uh, the flood would wash out, the, the mud would fall, and that's the land that we, that we live on. Um, but since the levees were constructed in the early 20th century, all that mud sort of just goes off into the Gulf of Mexico and drops off the continental shelf. And so that, the fact that it's not being constantly replenished is another part of the reason why the marshes are sinking. But those two processes together, one to aid shipping that helps the whole continent, you know, that helps the whole country anyway, and the other to... Um, enable us to get first, you know, coastal oil and now offshore oil that we all use. Those are the reasons that, that Louisiana is thinking. Great. Um, we just, uh, I wanna alert our, our participants that there is a question and answer function and we do invite questions. We, I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but um, we do have a first one. This is from um, your friend, uh, Jay Gitlin, Andy. Um, Jay asks, uh, to what degree has the narrative of Katrina obscured the narrative of Rita? So Hurricane Rita, also in 2005, um, also a, a catastrophic storm for many people, primarily in, um, in southwestern Louisiana, but many of the same places that were just hit again by Hurricane Laura. And that, that is also a terrible story. I was interested, and, and it has been eclipsed by Katrina, and I think part of the reason for that is 
while we can of course tell a sort of human history to the you know 12 foot wall of water that comes out out of the gulf of mexico and wipes out all of these people that live on the coast um, that is a kind of a different story than the federal government building a structure that's meant to keep people safe and that fails um, and the sort of questions that katrina gave rise to particularly in that week or that month right after the flood when many Americans ask, you know, how could this happen in the United States? And why do so many people suffering look black? You know, those questions about what American citizenship meant, means, um, and sort of how deeply ingrained racism is in American life, I think were just posed so starkly by Katrina that it, Katrina now means not just what happened in New Orleans in 2005, but also as a way of thinking about issues of race and class and citizenship and, and comes to stand for a lot of other things that, that these other disasters, which are terrible, don't, can't quite hold in the same way. Yeah, well, and it, it comes to stand for a whole, um, a kind of meaning of the word governance um, in, the, in the 21st century. I mean, I was so struck, I read, I read your book in manuscript many years ago, but reading the, the hot off the press, uh, Harvard University press copy that, um, that I just got, so I'm reading your book and, and my iPhone is just lighting up with pushes from the New York Times about Laura, about wildfires in California, about the pandemic, all of which kind of fit within the paradigm that you're describing of the kind of systems of governance that we've left ourselves and the, and the patterns of vulnerability that are, are just rooted in the kind of inequities and inequalities. Do you, do you want to say more about just in a, in zooming way out, you know, what, what does Katrina teach in the broadest sense about the state of our nation, about democracy and its failings and vulnerabilities, about um, the, the kind of governance in the, you know, post, let's call it the post 70s era. Um, you know, how right. does, how, what does Katrina teach? I guess I, I would, I would start by just agreeing with you and, and saying that I didn't, I didn't know all these things were gonna happen you know, when I started writing this book, but New Orleanians that I learned from kind of knew. They long understood, you know, there was, for those of us who watched Katrina from Connecticut or elsewhere, there was something that was said a lot that said, you know, this could never happen here. And that was often a, a critique from the left that said, you know, only in a place that's sort of marginal to American life. New Orleans is, is always imagined as a kind of exotic place. Um, that this kind of catastrophe, you know, it would never happen in New York City, for example. And then Hurricane Sandy happened in, in New York City. Um, and now, now we see, as you said, California burning and so many uh, Houston flooding, um, Puerto Rico flooding. And Katrina looks a lot less, like that, that kind of argument that Katrina is an exception of some kind no longer holds up. It's clear, you know, I, I think when historians write the kind of history of the 21st century, if we live long enough to be able to do such a thing, there will be, uh, Katrina will look like an opening scene for the kind of climate catastrophe and federal collapse. You know, one way of thinking about what Katrina is, is it's just hundreds of preventable deaths and years of preventable suffering, which now we all are, are living through as we, you know, as we experience the pandemic unevenly, but still it touches all of us in a way that we understand that it didn't have to be this way. Um, so I think, you know, okay, so what are, what are Katrina's, if Katrina is the kind of opening scene and announces where we are as 21st century America, um, it teaches us, I think, first of all, that that kind of, well, a, a sort of really cynical way of putting it is that racism doesn't work as well for white people as white people often believe that it will. But what, what I mean by that is, I think many, you know, whatever your politics were, many white people looked at Katrina and said, well, that flood is only affecting black people. But that was really selective vision. If you go back and watch that film footage from 2005, there's a lot of white people swimming around in the water too, because the impact of the flood was pretty broadly shared. Um, once the virus starts circulating, though we know that the deaths are disproportionately affecting people who are already structured as disadvantaged, uh, nobody is safe from that because we all rely on the state in ways that we see and don't see. Uh, and when the state fails, we all are at risk. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is that we see that those challenges can be 
pretty handily reapportioned by our social policies. So even if the flood is broadly shared, uh, it, then it's black people who aren't able to come home because our policies render them more vulnerable, which is a terribly dispiriting fact, unless you just sort of boil it down to the fact that our policies have, that our, our government is able to control who suffers and who doesn't. And the basic fact that policy can make it possible for some people to come home, that there are mechanisms by which you, know, you and I can work from home and not make ourselves vulnerable to the virus and other people can't. If it can work for some people, maybe that's a route for saying, you know, we could create those policies for everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. It reminds me of um, Heather McGee's argument. Um, Heather McGee, um, perhaps your classmate at Yale many years ago, but she now, uh, she has been the president of Demos. And she's working on a book that's on exactly this, the, um, the cost of racism to white people. And, and the, the metaphor she uses, I mean, this is a historical fact, but she uses it as metaphor, is um, the draining of, of public swimming pools in places like Nashville, um, where the white population, you know, rather than, I mean, heavy scare quotes here, suffer, the integration of a public pool would rather see it drain it so nobody can swim, right? And that's, for her, that's become the metaphor for the way we approach government in general, um, in, the, in the kind of post-great society world where, where race has structured uh, a kind of anti-statist conservatism and it has structured people's perceptions or misperceptions about how government works and what it can do and who it's for um, people would rather just drain the pool than, than actually have the protections that, that government and only government can, can provide. And now we're all kind of living with the vulnerabilities that are created by that. The, uh, moment, the, the moment for me, you know, my, my version of that story that I sort of encountered in the archive was there was the big, um, the big hurricane before Katrina was Betsy in 1965. Uh, and, and this arrived, you know, right, up, you could call it the high point of the great societies, right in the wake of Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Johnson's president. And um, so Hurricane Betsy uh, sends a storm surge into the industrial canal, which collapses, the flood walls collapse, it floods the lower ninth ward. Um, thousands of people's homes are flooded. And then it was, it was as it was in 2005, a neighborhood primarily of black people, um, empowered black people, middle-class black people, veterans who had been able to get the GI Bill, who had built this neighborhood, and felt like they had a kind of partnership with the federal government, which they tried to call on in the wake of the storm. And what they really wanted was, were grants, reparations, reparations for the failed federal infrastructure that would function as grants that would let them, in many places, move to higher ground. Now they knew that the Lower Ninth Ward was a dangerous place to live. And the, Democrat, the white Democratic politicians in Louisiana who were aligned with Johnson supported that vision and were prepared to give this unprecedented $10,000 know, grant that would let people sort of rebuild with autonomy somewhere safer. And then into that picture, I discovered, comes this guy named Eddie Hebert, who um, perversely, his, um, my office building at Tulane is named for this man, who was the uh, congressman in New Orleans from the 40s through the 70s, who had signed the Southern Manifesto and was just sort of unreconstructed Dixiecrat. And, he kills that bill, even though, and in doing so, and he killed it because he didn't want federal money. He understood that federal money going to empower black people in his district would unsettle his power. But in killing that bill, he took money away from all of his white constituents too, and they supported him in doing this. It was more important to them that their black neighbors not have help from the federal government than that they get help that they needed. Now, by the way, the policy, the sort of compromise, which is, you'll, you'll understand, was premised on debt. It was that they got loans from the Small Business Administration to rebuild, and the loans required collateral. The only collateral people had in the Lower Ninth was their flooded real estate. So the federal policy after Betsy was to force people to rebuild in a neighborhood they knew was dangerous. So, you know, in 2005, people ask, well, why did people live in these places? The federal government made them to, you know, against their best efforts to move and made them to specifically because um, the racism of their neighbors would not allow them to get the help they needed, even though it would have helped these white neighbors too. And that story, as you say, is about swimming pools. Um, it's about the fight against universal health care. It's the fight against 
you know, any kind of social good that might be broadly shared. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of questions rolling in, which is great to see, and we will get to as many as we can. Um, let me just ask you one more question. I want to just go back to something you touched on really briefly um, earlier on. I mean, one of the things I love about your book, it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's, um, it's interdisciplinary in the sense that it's built environment, it's, it's um, social geography, it's politics, it's policy, um, it's straight ahead social history, political history, it's a lot of things. But kind of it's framed in a way that as a cultural historian I just love it because it's framed by the the kind of ideational work that's both the idea and the ideology that's encrusted in a word like disaster and the and what what the word disaster allows us to see and perhaps forces us to see and what the word disaster keeps us from seeing and so it's a very philosophical book. I don't know if you feel that about it, but that's, that's how I read it. Um, and I just wanna hear you say more about that, about what you learned about disaster as a concept, because when you have this great line, you said, you know, people think that it's weather or the weather event like Katrina that makes the history relevant, um, but it's actually the other way around. It's the history that makes the weather relevant. And I just thought that's a brilliant formulation. And I wonder if you could just say more about what you learned about disaster and what you see at stake in a broad concept like that and the way that it, it kind of frames our public discourse. I really appreciate that reading, Matt. Thank you, thank you for it. Um, what, what does, what, so the, the, I came to understand that disaster was a kind of theory of change that said change kind of comes out of nowhere and happens very quickly. Um, the, the metaphor or the sort of archetypal disaster in this view is a lightning strike, you know, um, here it comes. And, and, and what you see, if you just look at that short picture is bad luck, you know, poor Matt, he went walking down the street, he was struck by lightning. There's nothing they can do. Um, if you widen your view a little bit, you can often see, Oh, you know, Daphne made you go outside in a thunderstorm holding a lightning rod. You know, <laughs> there's, there's usually, usually that vulnerability is a product of human decisions, social arrangements. But, but more than that, by seeing disasters as um, departures from the normal course of things, insidiously, the disaster idea normalizes everything that happened around them, you know, in the same way that kind of the measure slavery and freedom sort of, you know, create each other together. I came to see that the idea of disaster, like the most important work it did was to create order. And so what I, what I mean by that is we were talking before about homeless people. I'll, I'll go to that example. Um, a person who loses their house in a flood is seen as suffering a disaster and they're entitled to all sorts of um, sorrow and charity. But a person who loses her home because her mortgage goes underwater by making a disaster out of the person who lost their house in the flood, that kind of economic disruption is then seen as normal and they don't get anything. Uh, and, and again and again, the creation of the category of disaster and making some suffering illegitimate legitimizes all other suffering. And I, I've come to think this is just a terribly insidious concept. You see it play out all the time. For example, uh, when Joe Biden a few months ago said that because um, the, the pandemic's a disaster, no one should have to pay for their, their COVID treatment. And this makes perfect sense. Why would anyone have to pay why should anyone be too poor to live through COVID? Uh, it makes perfect sense until you ask, well, that, by saying that, he says that people should have to pay for their cancer treatment or their heart disease treatment or all, any other of the diseases that equally, you know, one is blameless for. Um, so by creating a, cat, a special category of suffering, it makes all other suffering acceptable. Um, and, and I was really out to write a book about Katrina that, that saw things that way, that, that didn't make too much of a fetish around the storm and understood that people have been, been suffering for a very long time in America and that we should understand that, that Katrina in, in that way was a product of history, not an exception from it. Right, great, good. Okay, let's pick up some of these questions. Can, can you read them yourself? Can you, are you, can you access them? There's a little- uh... Yes, I, I can now. I will let you, instead of my kind of picking and choosing oh, for you, um, why don't you just choose the ones that, um, and if you miss one that I think is a great question, I'll bring you back to it. Okay, I will just, um, maybe I'll work in the order that I see them. I see one from 
from Claire that says, for you, what was the most surprising thing you learned about Katrina? Um, I think I touched on this a bit when I, when I said I was so surprised that, I, I just assumed going into the story that I was going to encounter a kind of straight line racism that made black people and also a, a, a economic inequality that rendered poor people particularly vulnerable to the flood. And I was really shocked. I had looked, looked at the numbers a million different ways to make sure this was true, that that was not what happened. And that rather those inequalities that we come to see as a product of Katrina were in fact product of the recovery, not the water itself. It ended up structuring the whole project, but that was really surprising to me at the beginning. Yeah. In some ways, it's the, also the product of the, the racism of the media coverage that week, isn't it? I mean, I, I, mean, I just remember the, the media frame was, you know, oh my God, um, the U.S. is becoming a third world country. And, you know, look at all these refugees and like the whole, all of the language that was mobilized around it was, was heavily racialized and it was really covered as a raced event, uh, which it was. But in, with lethal with lethal consequences, you know that the idea that the that uh, that the city was was disordered gave rise almost immediately to these horrific visions of things that didn't happen. Like there were accounts of cannibalism coming from New Orleans. Right. There were accounts in that the super, in the Superdome. Were, yeah, in the yeah, Superdome. yeah, yeah, yeah. That there were people raping babies in the Superdome. That there were people snipers shooting at um, medical helicopters, and none of this happened. But the governor responded to those rumors as if they were true and pulled the National Guard off of the search and rescue mission to go restore order in the city and sort of authorized them to kill, believing that there was a kind of racial Armageddon. The National Guard New Orleans police shot nine black people in the city. More people were shot by police than were shot in any kind of disordered fight among you know, New Orleanians. So, so absolutely, and, and that kind of racialized vision of what and racist vision of what happened endured all the way through. People saw, even from the, from the moment the city flooded, um, believe that it would be inevitable that black people would suffer more. And then that became a self-fulfilling prophecy. The head of HUD said in September, 2005, New Orleans is not gonna be as black as it was before for, for a long time, if ever. This was the man who controlled billions of federal dollars. If anybody could decide what was gonna to happen to the city, it was him. And yet he was announcing it as if it was a fait accompli and he had no control over it. In doing so, again, that's another insidious fact of the disaster idea. He naturalized that outcome, took it out of the realm of human history and said that it was going to be a product of the water and then did things like close 5,000 apartment, public housing apartments that were largely undamaged and didn't allow the people to live in them to come home. And those are the neighborhoods that are most depopulated now since Katrina, not the most flooded neighborhoods, neighborhoods that had housed public housing before. So it was always a self-fulfilling prophecy and, and totally raced in that way. Yeah. Um, I see my, David Blight's question. I see David Blight, my, hi David, <laughs> my beloved teacher. He says, if Katrina and all the other storms cannot change the minds of the Trump party of the reality of the climate change crisis, what will? Well, of course, I think David agrees that nothing will and that um, we are not at a point right now where power is gonna be a story of persuasion. It's gonna be a story of wielding power. Um, I think, you know, the idea that reasonable people will look at California burning in Louisiana underwater, with the Gulf Coast underwater, um, and, and on and on and on and think, you know, that finally something else will happen that will change people's minds or, or kidding themselves. We have an ideological fight for our lives really in the country. And David knows this better than I do, that those fights are often um, don't remain in the, in the realm of metaphor. So... Right. It's actually worse than an ideological war. It's it's an epistemological war. That's right. I mean, we're we're a society not just divided by opinions, but divided by the facts we believe in, uh, or, or or disbelieve. And it's very hard to see how we think our way out of this. That's just an observation. <laughs> yeah, I, I I agree with you. And you know, one one wants to go further and and to say that what success then looks like is sort of eradicating not those people, but those views. But the only way to win is to sort of, is for truth to actually triumph and for those positions to not be acceptable in public discourse anymore. But we have a long way to go. Yeah. Uh, Elihu Rubin, another friend, says, given your prognosis for the long-term environmental basis of New Orleans, 
Is it cruel or absurd to imagine winding down an entire city or region over a 40, 80, 120 year life cycle? What would you tell urban planners today to avoid past mistakes? Can we make progress at all under capitalism? Well, that's one of those questions that's like a reverse funnel where it starts out seeming specific and then ends up whether progress is possible under capitalism. Uh, I'm gonna just pick on Elihu's lack of a, I'm reading his, see if this is a fair critique. Yeah, there's, when he says, to imagine winding down an entire city or region, I notice that there's no actor there. He doesn't, he elides who would do the winding down. And I think that this is where, where we all, um, as concerned humane citizens need to put our attention is, is who gets to make these decisions. There was a plan that oh, you may be aware of, I, I should explain that quickly, is um, in the late fall, the winter of 2005, 2006, there was a plan that came to be known as the Green Dot Plan for shrinking New Orleans. And what it imagined doing was um, preventing people from rebuilding in the neighborhoods that had flooded. Now, this was, there were racist elements of this plan. Lakeview, the white neighborhood was gonna be able to rebuild, the Lower Ninth wasn't. But, but in theory, it was, it was created by humane expert planners who um, wanted to keep people out of harm's way. The way it was received in New Orleans was as dispossession of black New Orleans. And many people believe, you know, who understood that they had been um, suffering as a result of a federal failure, the failure of the federal levy system. It was not built up to code. It shouldn't have fallen. Um, and, and therefore believed they had a right of return and saw this as really kind of, you know, urban renewal as Negro removal was how it was read in the city and not unfairly so based on what its impacts would be. Had it been described rather as, um, well, if repopulating the whole city had been described as we're going to encourage black people to return to the most vulnerable neighborhoods of the city where they are most likely to drown in their own homes, the plan might have been received differently. Um, so, and I, I phrase it that way just to point out that there's no easy answers to these things. What happened in New Orleans was that, it, with, that many of these decisions were taken out of the hands of the people who were most affected by them. And so my concern about the future of New Orleans and of New York City and other coastal places that are terribly imperiled by rising seas is to say that we need, we know that many of our even very enlightened and humane schemes are likely to fail because the problems we face are so hard. So therefore, what I think we need to focus on is building a kind of civic structure that can endure those failures where people can feel like even if the plan doesn't turn out the way they want it to, at least it was fair. At least they felt like they had a part of it. I think what we need is sort of less brilliant planning and more functioning democracy to make these things work. Um, so that's the that's what I would tell urban planners to avoid is the sort of cult of expertise that haunts planning as a discipline and rather think about creating democratic processes that let people exert some control over their lives. Jacob Murrow Spitzer. Should broader non-disastrous aspects of climate change, not hurricanes, floods, fires, but rising temperatures, eroding land, moving dying populations, et cetera, similarly be understood in this longer historical social framework you lay out in studying Katrina. There's obviously seductive media coverage of quick moving disasters, but climate change on a whole is not that. Is this a model for relaying the slower catastrophic impacts of climate change? Well, absolutely. I mean to have us look away from that spectacular catastrophic incident and think instead about broader social change. Um, so so I, I think I, I agree with that idea. I want to see if I missed anything in the, in the question. Can you say a little bit about what, um, you know, on the public square, what the slow violence kind of argument would look like? Um, because it's, it's easier, you know, when there's a Sandy or a, a Katrina or a wildfire rage, um, it's easier to make the case to, you know, in, in, to an American public. Um, than to talk about these these creeping slower kinds of of violence and, and environmental degradation. So, what what would the slow violence argument look like in our popular discourse? Um, uh, well, I mean, what there's 
It's an interesting question. I, I, I guess, I think that, uh, I think we're coming to terms with the idea that sort of, that racism and economic inequality structure so much of our life that people are more comfortable seeing it. I mean, you see it, for example, in the fight over pre-existing conditions around the pandemic. The idea that people have been rendered more vulnerable as a result of, you know, um, history, basically, rather than that their bodies are somehow differently affected by the virus. But to zoom out a little bit, I think the slow violence argument starts a little like this. As, as catastrophic as 200,000 dead from the pandemic are, um, I think we're at, you know, one and a half million dead from gun violence over the past decades. Uh, more people will still die of heart disease this year. More people, many people will die of cancer because they live near some sort of toxic emitter. Um, and so we, by, again, by looking at the emergency, we can insidiously blind ourselves from these other, and have become normalized to death by other means. And I think we should focus a little bit less on the, the cause than the consequence. We should think about homelessness rather than how one loses a home. We should think about health rather than how one is rendered sick. And building those kinds of structures, which you know, many of our so-called you know, peer countries have, like a right to housing or a right to health care, turns out that those are by far the best disaster policies, not episodic attempts to sort of quickly put a Band-Aid on one wound, but being able to live a healthy life your whole life, no matter what happens. Um, so th that's how I think I would start to answer mm -hmm. that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Aaron. Aaron Good asks, in your book, one of the major political figures you write a lot about is Leander Perez, a figure with a malign influence in many respects, but who represents an enduring tradition and style in American politics. Similar to the populist patriarchal style of Huey Long, but also different in important ways. What is his significance? Well, I see we only have seven minutes and I could certainly do seven hours on Leander Perez. So I'll do, uh, this is what I'll say about Perez, who I'm obsessed with. He was the uh, district attorney for Plaquemines Parish. This is the county that frames the last hundred miles of the Mississippi River, downriver from New Orleans. Um, he was the DA from 1924 to 1960. And he has sort of been painted as a dinosaur, the sort, uh, sort of Jim Crow Southern sheriff. He was proudly called himself America's staunchest segregationist. Um, in the 1920s, long story short, as uh, oil was being discovered in Louisiana's coastal wetlands, he manipulated, he got the state legislature to pass a series of constitutional amendments that let him take control of the public agencies that controlled those mineral rights, the oil rights, and gave a little bit to the state. And that little bit he gave to the state of Louisiana is what fueled Huey Long's socialist vision of sharing the wealth. That oil money, the little percentage of oil money that went to the state coffers was what had Huey Long um, come up with the idea basically of old age pensions that pushed FDR to pass the Social Security Act. So the leftovers of the oil money helped to fuel American welfare states such as we have it. But the rest went into his pockets, to Perez's pockets. Uh, he made millions and millions of dollars during the depression with Louisiana's oil money. And in doing so, he deregulated the environment um, deregulated industrial development, um, funded, he was, he was a staunch racist, funded the uh, presidential campaigns of Strom Thurmond in 1948 and George Wallace, and wedded the racist idea of states' rights, which was meant to keep the federal government out of intervening to help black people, also use states' rights to uh, protect oil interests so that he could keep up his corrupt bargaining with them. So this guy who I'd encountered, you know, who I sort of, he's famous among historians as being, like I said, a kind of dinosaur of the old order, came to me to seem like the avant-garde of modern conservatism. He was disfranchising voters, he's deregulating the environment, he's fighting for racism, and he's in bed with the oil industry. He would, you know, fit in just great in the Trump administration. So uh, I became interested in him because he sort of, he comes first in the story and in many ways explains everything that happened afterwards. It's his actions that helped to sink New Orleans um, physically. It's the political economy that he helped to shape that structured that kind of inequality. It's his fight against the federal government that informs everybody, that informs everything that followed it in terms of not wanting to help broadly, not, not wanting to create any broad social structures. And I guess I'll say one more thing about him. 
one of the things that's really hard, Matt, you know this as a historian, is that you know what happened in the end. And there's this tendency and fear about not wanting to impute your present knowledge onto people in the past. And so I came to see that Perez and the system that he created and represented had done all this damage, but I didn't quite feel comfortable hating him as much as I did um, because how could he have known differently? And then I found this guy named Emile Riche, who is not someone who's famous. He's, he was a, a truck farmer who lived in Plaquemines Parish. Um, he grew vegetables to uh, sell at the French market in New Orleans. And he was a sign painter. And he painted these signs that stood in his front yard for decades. And they said things that ba he basically said, Leander Perez, you're destroying Louisiana. Stop stealing the oil money, you're sinking the parish. And all the things that Perez did wrong, this guy, Emil Riche, painted on his signs and he was, um, the signs were, were, you know, they drew attention. So he was photographed in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. And the, the delicious thing about Plaquemines Parish for me is that there's only one road to get to the courthouse. And it, Emil Riche lived on it, which means that every day when Leander Perez went to work, for 30 years, he had to drive by these signs telling him to stop and telling him what the costs were. So suddenly there was someone there that could make me, that sort of authorized the critique that said, he could have known better. Here's the road, you know, the road not taken. It could have gone another way. And that to me was the kind of, you know, if there's sort of one broadest lesson in the book, it's that things didn't have to be this way. Things could have gone another way. Thank you for that. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to shoehorn two more questions into our closing minutes, one of, one of which I think is going to take us a little bit to the dark side, and the other one maybe will bring us back into the light. Um, the darker question is from Rosie Lee, if you want to read that. Uh, let me. A paper in 2009 argued that the social arrangements essentially created a disaster capitalism, while, um, ex which exaggerates and prolongs the disaster syndrome for some help some parties to make disaster profitable. What's your observation on those who actually benefit from disaster? Well, the, the short version of that is some people absolutely benefited from sort of local New Orleanians who, who said, announced in 2015 that they felt like the recovery had served them well and their lives were better, to the big, you know, the big corporation called ICF International that the state subcontracted the road home program that we were talking about before, subcontracted the administration of that program to this company, which then made, went public and made a billion dollars in profits that year while distributing essentially zero grants. So in, you know, from, uh, in every level of analysis, people make money off the suffering of others. And I think it's less, you know, I, I, don't, I don't quite use the term disaster capitalism because I think it, again, makes an exception out of what happens around disasters that we don't talk about Christmas capitalism, but people try to sell you stuff at a profit then too. This is just how capitalism operates. Profit seeking, that's the value proposition. Um, so, so yeah, I, I agree that that's what happened and it, and it continues to happen. There are people selling um, whatever equipment they're using to try to put out the wildfires in California. Someone's making money on that too. And now potentially bringing us into the light, but maybe just bringing us into more capitalism. A question from Daphne B. Uh, where does Beyonce fit into this story? <laughs> Beyonce with her, her Creole heritage, her Louisiana Creole heritage. Um, and her, her Superdome. Yes, yeah, yeah, of course, Lemonade and her, yeah, her. Um, but I want to, I want to actually just think about Beyonce as a, um, masterful performer and, and, and think also about, about Helly's question about what is the future of New Orleans. Um, I've all but said, and now I will say that New Orleans will sink and there is a period in the future in which the physical place will not exist. We will lose the architecture. Uh, you won't be able to go there anymore. But I think that that is not all that New Orleans means to people. And if we think we haven't talked you know, at all today really about New Orleans as a just incredible world historical achievement of creativity, particularly black creativity, coming out of just the worst possible manifestation of the slave trade. Coming out of that is 
just a vision of cosmopolitan America, a vision of creativity manifest in jazz, a vision of celebration manifest in Mardi Gras, the weekly second lines through the street that celebrate community on a local level and the sort of virtuosic display of dancing or Mardi Gras Indians, all of those things um, have very little to do with the physical place where it happens. And Beyonce too, you know, many of Beyonce's roads that Daphne better than I to say this, but lead back through New Orleans and what New Orleans has given the world. And Beyonce did it from Houston. And I think that the fact that you could sort of be this just extraordinary vision of what New Orleans could offer the world and come from somewhere else, to me, does give some reason for optimism about the future that out of terrible suffering can come just extraordinary beauty and that it can happen anywhere that people have enough support to be able to build the communities that need it. That is kind of a brighter place to land on this uh, difficult story. Um, Andy Horowitz, I cannot thank you enough. Um, it's really, it's been a joy to talk to you tonight. Um, I want to remind everyone that October 27, we'll be talking about the U.S. Postal Service, um, more and more relevant to our functioning democracy. Um, and in the meantime, the book is Katrina, A History. Everyone should read it. Um, thank you to everyone and uh, hope to, to see you, you know, somewhere soon. <laughs> thank you, Matt. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Luis.